How much trust uh, is enough? That's the question we set out to answer in some research. The trust agenda fits very well with EY. To a large extent, we're, our, our corporate purpose is about trust. It's about helping public sector institutions build and maintain trust and help the capital markets maintain trust where that doesn't exist. And to that extent, we have a problem. Uh, it's already been mentioned today a couple of times. There is a crisis in confidence in business at the moment. I could have chosen any number of articles from this year. This was from the FT this year, and it talked about uh, big business being all about management greed, being about tax dodging, uh, and being about short-termism. And, th and these weren't uh, anarchists or fringe groups talking about it. It, it was people like John McFarlane, chairman of Barclays. It was Douglas Flint from HSBC. It was Carolyn Fairburn, director general of CBI. Uh, even Justin Welby, I think, a, a former oil executive and Archbishop of Canterbury, was talking about the system being broken. So if you then bank that and say we're not building on solid foundations of trust in business, and you overlay this rise of data, so this, you know, this analogy of data as a new oil is quite a compelling and seductive uh, thought. The UK industrial strategy that was published this week you know, put more stimulus into data, uh, the AI and, and uh, the data economy being one of the grand challenges. And I think if you go back to that analogy of data as a new oil, I'm pretty certain the early oil explorers weren't thinking about sustainability and ethics as they, as they sought to monetize that first asset. Um, so so you've, got, you've got a kind of, you've got that, that building up. So then you say, so how can we help businesses be innovative in the way they use data? And you know, regardless of a lot of the press, from working myself with, with corporates around data, they really feel like the foothills of what can be achieved with the data explosion. So there's going to be this rush. So how can we help them do it in a really positive way? Uh, and that was really what we sought to, to answer in our research. Um, so we did three, three elements of research. One was um, a survey of 200 executives around this kind of trust, first of all, but also how they saw data and, to some extent, GDPR playing into that. I also had the backdrop of a, a big study we did globally on purpose, corporate purpose, and I want to talk about the role that that plays. We then did a series of focus groups and interviews, and also some quantitative analysis of the impact that markets, uh, that, that the company's valuation would have in the, mar in the market, uh, where there's a data loss or breach that took place. So let me, let me now get into that. So the first finding was good news, trust pays. So there's certainly a sense in the, in the corporate community that we spoke to that trust is a good thing. There's always one, isn't there? 99% said trustworthiness matters. Um, <laughs> And then the, the, the purpose thing was quite interesting because when you ask companies, do you have a purpose, I think 95% of corporate executives at the leadership level would say, yes, we have a purpose. But what you're seeing now is a shift. 50% uh, of the people we asked in that big global survey said that they were rethinking their purpose because of disruption towards a more human-centric, society-centric purpose. And I think you could, uh, you could, you could debate what, you know, what's the reason for that. You know, I think employees play a role in that. I think we as uh, workers expect a more authentic, purposeful organisation. Uh, I think there's new leaders coming to the top who genuinely feel passionate about having not just single, single stakeholder purposes like delivering cash back to investors, but multi-stakeholder purposes. But then there's the cold economics of it as well. And, you know, how, uh, which comes first, I'm not sure, but certainly 50% can see the value of trust as it relates to financial results. So that's the upside. But then on the right-hand side, this gets into the study we did of the market. So we, we looked at 20 companies listed in the FTSE 100 and looked at data events over a 20-day period. I'll visualize it for you. I think it's quite visually quite impactful because when you see point zero, that's the point at which a data breach happens, a data loss event happens. Uh, and the, the stats guys did a great job of stripping out all the other market noise and showing that on average 7% over 10 days. Once beyond that window, it starts to get too noisy. We couldn't measure it. But the other, the other interesting thing we did was we asked the team to see if we could do the reverse. So where are those positive news stories around data and you know, promoting the positive in, in activity around data protection, data privacy, data sharing, um, what could we find? And we, couldn't fi we just couldn't find any, any strong relationships. And I'd, I'd like to revisit that a little bit later on. So let me now dive into a few different perspectives. So let's put, our shoes, let's, let's put ourselves in the shoes of a CEO right now. So the CEO has Brexit to deal with, has disruption, industry convergence, competition coming from all kinds of different places. And then this, you know, this rush for data, 85% of the people we surveyed said that data was critical to the strategy. 
Over 70% said that ethical standards around data was important to trust, but around the same amount struggled to then uh, feel it's harder to demonstrate that trust. And then, and then GDPR. So 13% of respondents said they're ready for GDPR. We've had a bit of a debate as to should we be more worried about the 13% or more worried about the 87%, but I guess you take your own view on that. But what, one of the striking things was that 50% of the corporate executives in charge of, in charge of this said that, that GDPR wouldn't be enough. So then you take that and say, okay, so what would, what would, be, what would help protect, if, if legislation clearly and regulation can only play a role to some extent, what, where else do you go? Um, you know, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a kind of good propagation of ethical standards, ethical codes, uh, governance bodies being set up, we talked about that earlier, but only 15% of respondents felt that ethical codes and standards would work in their business. Over 50% said that it was down to corporate culture. I'd like to just dwell on that. And then the, the other one, which you then link to that, is when, you asked, when we asked about barriers, the, the biggest barrier to ethical approaches to data was, was um, short-termism. Over 60% said short-termism. So you've got this cultural aspect and then short-termism. So I think that's, you know, we have to recognise that in the corporate psyche and, and ask why that is. Well, part of it is the relationship with investors. If the equity narrative is around delivering returns to shareholders, then naturally that will drive short-termism. Communicating long-term value to investors is incredibly important, uh, but incredibly difficult. More and more companies are trying to do it, and part of the, the, the problem with it is that over 50% of, of, of a typical company's balance sheet is now made up by intangible assets. So if you put data in that, so if you put data as now an asset, being good with data, should be an asset, but there's no consistent way of measuring that and communicating that to investors. So investors move their money where they can most clearly see where the returns are going to come from. But there are innovative ways that investors are starting to get at this. I'll share a story. When we did our, when we did our interviews, we met with one of the investment houses and they, and they shared a sell, a sell note for a fast-moving consumer goods company where they were looking to analyze the culture, corporate conduct, and specifically data ethics, and the extent to which it was a very aggressive sales culture, delivering great returns, but the question was, have we properly priced in the risk of a blow-up? And having, having spent five pages documenting it, including one whole page analysing data from Glassdoor.com, that employee website, one page analysing Glassdoor.com, they concluded that they hadn't, and the advice to the fund managers was to sell. So you can see now that corporates are losing control of the narrative. And that's why, when you go back to that data, about 70, over 70% of corporates say that it's harder to prove trust. I think you see that happening. So what's the role of the consumer? We, we've said earlier the consumer has a, a, a very important voice to play. I like the idea of bringing them into the debate earlier. I think that's really important. Um, we've seen through the data, so in that graph, when you go beyond that 10-day window, there's enough data to show that the more the consumer was active, the... the the longer it took to recover. So in other words, the more backlash there was, the longer it took to recover. And that's investors looking at that and seeing what's the, well, the ongoing liability. But to me, the debate is far too negative. It's too much centered on the downside and the fines and the reputational damage. And it's really, really hard to talk to corporates about the upside of this, but I think that's where we've got to get to if we want to make progress. Um, part of it might actually lie in, part of the answer might lie in our survey results. So, uh, when we asked the question, should you reward customers for data sharing, over 70% said yes. So there are a few examples coming through, and I think, that, that I think we'll see that coming. The more proactive and the more enlightened organizations will be offering rewards for data sharing, will be offering rewards and be transparent about what data they share, and create mutual value, that idea of mutual value exchange for consumers. So what's next? Well, I think, you know, we've talked about purpose and culture. I think when you come back to, you know, ethics and standards and codes, if you look back over the corporate scandals over the last 10, 20 years, all of those companies have had ethics codes and controls and policies in place and governance forums. And when you, when you do your root cause analysis and corporate problems, it comes down to culture. And I think there's not a quick win. I didn't put quick win up there deliberately. But I think we've got to help companies work out how do they build this positivity into their organizational purpose, particularly around data ethics. GDPR is a catalyst. So a lot of interviewees talked about GDPR, trying to get GDPR away from a compliance exercise and being positive about it. 
In fact, one senior board member said that when they started the conversation on the board about GDPR, they ended up in a what are we about conversation, what are we using data for, how do we want to treat customers, and the chief exec was tasked with coming back with a data strategy. And I think that's really interesting to, to see how that plays out. And then this final point is we've got to help corporates measure and communicate the value of the positive, of the positive and, and how, they, how they treat data. So I asked how much trust is enough. Well, it's clear investors want it, consumers want it, uh, and corporates want it. But the question is, how can we create a positive narrative and build that into the organizational purpose? Thank you. <laughs>